this is our model specification. We assume that our return process y t has some unconditional, some conditional mean and the error term epsilon t, which has the decomposition z t sigma t and sigma square t follows an garch 1 1 process. In order to make sure that the specification in equation 1 is actually a conditional variance process, we need to make sure that the omega is not negative and not zero. Remember, variance cannot be zero. And then alphas and betas, they will be all, they are allowed to take the zero value. First thing we're going to show is that the GARCH11 can be rewritten as an arch infinity process. Okay, so what do we do? We reformulate the GARCH11 a little bit in terms of the lag operator. In terms of lag operator, that would mean sigma square t and then 1 minus lag operator beta. And on the right, we have the usual arch story. Now, we can multiply now both sides of the equation with the inverse of this bracket. It exists if and only if the beta is smaller than 1 in the absolute value. And that's important. And you can only do this under this condition. As you recall from the time series courses, then if we multiply this whole, I mean, sorry for that, that should be after the bracket, the sigma square t can be then written as omega and then 1 plus beta here, and then the infinite sum of everything. So alpha remains the same. And then you have the betas to the power of i, epsilon t minus 1 minus i, and the summation index runs from 0 to infinity. OK, so that means that we have here some mu and lots and lots and lots of lags which are coming from the inverse of the lag operator. And this is nothing else as an arch infinity. Immediately we see that just adding one simple term into our GAR specification already allows us so much it allows us to model the conditional variance process as an arch infinity by having only two parameters and not a lot of lax p. In order to look at the other properties of the GARCH11 model, it is very convenient to rewrite it as an ARMA11. Similar exercise as we have done for the ARCH processes. So if we write down our GARCH11 specification, and then we add and subtract epsilon t. Then this guy goes on the left, and sigma squared t goes on the right. We now add and subtract another term beta epsilon t minus 1 squared, and the same with the minus. Finally, we could collect the terms. And now we do a familiar trick. We call this difference an error term, nu t. And then we can proceed with our derivations by showing that the new t is a valid error term, is a marching deal difference sequence with zero mean, finite variance, and no serial correlation. First thing to do is to have a look at the expected value of this error term. We plug in the definition 
Remember, zt is an independent random variable, therefore we can pull it out of the expected value sign. Next step would be to show the absence of the serial correlation. So this is for all j which are non-zero. We plug in the definitions of the error terms. And now we open the brackets. We then insert the definition of the epsilon t squared, which is z t squared sigma t squared, and the same for the other term. We now remember that z t squared in expectation is 1, is the variance of the standard normal variable, and then we see immediately that the terms sigma squared t, sigma squared t minus j, they cancel out all the time. So this is the terms with the minus, and this is the term with the plus. So there is no serial correlation in our newly defined error term. Finally, what we need to do, we need to look at the variance. The variance of the error term can be represented as the expected value of the square minus the square of the expectation. And we have shown just before that this expectation is zero. That's what we only need to do. We need to consider the expected value of our error term squared. Again, we plug in the definition of the epsilon t. We then can pull out sigma squared t out of the bracket. It becomes sigma t to the power of 4. Then we can split the expectation due to the independence of sigma of the zt. This is a multiplication sign in between. We then see that it could simplify to expected value of sigma t to the power of 4 times. Okay, what is the kurtosis? 3 minus 2 times variance. 1 plus 1. Okay, so this is just times 2. And finally, what we can show is that under certain conditions, which we will talk about later, we could split the expected value of the sigma t to the power of 4 into the ratio of the epsilon t to the power of 4 and z t to the power of 4. So what do we see? We see that the error term has a finite variance as long as the expected value of epsilon t to the power of 4 is finite. Okay? And under this condition, we can always use the ARMA 1 1 representation of our GARCH 1 1 process here in the star. So we can write epsilon t squared as a function of epsilon t minus 1 with alpha plus beta coefficient in front and the error term, which has an arm structure. What else did we just learn? We have just learned that this process will be stationary under the condition that the absolute value of the coefficient standing in front of the autoregressive part is an absolute value smaller than 1. Okay, so what we have, we have a stationarity condition on the GARCH 1 1 process. Next property what we're going to look at is the unconditional variance of the error term. Okay, so once again, what is the unconditional expectation of the error term? It is the expectation of zt sigma t and due to the independency and assumptions on the zt we can write it down as 0 times expected value of sigma t and that's 0, which is fine. Thus, we can write down the unconditional variance of epsilon t as the expected value of epsilon t squared. Okay, this is due to the fact that the unconditional mean of the error term is zero. 
Right, so now we plug in our ARMA representation definition, which we have just derived, which is omega and then alpha plus beta, the autoregressive part, and then the ARMA structure in the error term. The error term has nice properties, we have shown them. And then we say that under stationarity on the epsilon t squared, that is, that if the stationarity condition holds, then we could combine those two terms on one side and write down that the expected value of epsilon t squared due to the stationarity assumptions would be 1 minus alpha minus beta. And that's going to be denoted as unconditional variance of epsilon. Okay, that is great. So now what do we know? We know stationarity. We also know constraints which we need for positivity. Fantastic. Now these are a must have in order to have a well-defined, stationary, wonderful, conditional heteroskedasticity process. So conditional and pass filtration. What are the conditions will come now for the parameters, they are desired properties, what we want to have from the model, but they are not necessary. What is necessary are stationarity and positivity parameter constraints. Having said that, let's look at the volatility clustering. This is our GARCH11, represented as an ARMA11. Now what we will do, uh, we will rewrite our omega as sigma squared times 1 minus alpha minus beta. And this I know from the definition of the unconditional variance of the error term. What is volatility clustering about? Volatility clustering is about taking the conditional expectation of those quantities and then trying to interpret them. So if your conditional variance process was larger than the unconditional expectation of it in the previous period, then alpha plus beta tells you about the persistence of its influence on the future difference between the shock at period T and its unconditional expectation. So our shock will die out if alpha plus beta is closer to zero and will stay persistent if alpha plus beta is closer to one. So yesterday's deviation from mean explains today's expected deviation from mean. That's the formal mathematical interpretation of volatility clustering. So volatility clustering is there. Now it's time to move to the outliers. We now are going to derive the kurtosis which results from the GART11 process in a similar fashion as we have done for the ART. Here I'm already using the fact that the expected value of the error term is zero. Okay, so this denominator guy will be sigma squared epsilon to the power of 2, as we have derived in the arch story, then we could write the epsilon t to the power of 4 as 3 times expected value of sigma t to the power of 4, and now we're going to work with that and see what happens. we plug in the definition of the sigma squared. And then we open the brackets. After you have opened the brackets, it's time to plug in the definition of the epsilon t as zt sigma t. Okay, so now what do we know? 
we know that we could pull out the 3 out of zt minus 4 expectation. We see that the same term enters here. We also know that actually this two terms are identical in the sense that they represent the unconditional variance of epsilon. And then we have alpha beta and then the expected value of the zt to the power of 2 is 1. So we have again the sigma squared t sigma to the power of 4 t minus 1. And now we can finally combine all the terms with sigma to the power of 4 and obtain the following expression. We then assume stationarity. And we combine on the term on the right hand side with the term on the left hand side. Now we finally plug in the definition of the unconditional variance. And get the following. So first let's pull out the denominator at one side. That allows us to pull out omega squared outside of the brackets, multiply it with 1 minus alpha minus beta, and then we have a big denominator. Finally, we arrive to the expression for the sigma to the power of 4. The last step to do is to plug this in into the definition of a kurtosis. In order to make it a kurtosis, we need to multiply it by 3. Then we have 1 minus alpha minus beta in nominator. And then we also need to divide it by the squared unconditional variance, which is the same as multiplying it by the inverse of the unconditional variance. Finally, we can cancel out some terms. This is our kurtosis. Now, in order to show how does it relate with 3, we will add and subtract 3 to find out whether GARCH11 captures over kurtosis. So what we have, we have 3, and then we need to my have minus 3 in the denominator. Okay, now it's time to simplify the terms in the denominator. What do we have? 3 cancel out. Then what do we have in terms of alpha squared? We have 9 alpha squared minus 3. What do we have in terms of the beta squared? They cancel out. So do the alpha beta. And similar to the arch story, we have some non-negative or strictly positive in the matter of fact nominator. And in order to assure that our model captures our kurtosis, we do need to assure that the denominator is larger than zero. Okay, so how do we do that? You can rewrite it in the following equation and then you can reformulate it as a constraint um, on your parameters. So they have to satisfy the following condition. If the GARCH11 parameters satisfy this condition, then indeed our model is able to capture our kurtosis. However, if the estimated alpha and beta do not follow in this equation, then we can guarantee that the kurtosis of the error term is larger than 3.
The next property which we are going to consider is the autocorrelations of epsilon t. And we need to derive them explicitly in order to understand how do alpha and beta parameters of GARCH 101 model actually influence the autocorrelation function decay. We will start with the ARMA representation of our GARCH 101 process. Technically, the derivations of autocorrelation functions will be exactly the same. So remember how you did it in time series. You say that, okay, let's subtract the unconditional mean from both sides of the equation. And then you had this autoregressive parameter, which is now just alpha and beta. And basically you proceed with the same derivations as before. Now that we could simplify these terms of constant, because we can write down that omega times mu here is the same as writing minus phi times mu. Thus, we could rewrite the whole story as autoregressive coefficient times epsilon t minus 1 squared minus mu. Okay, so this representation will be very useful for us just in terms of notation because you can now define all the autocorrelations as a expectation of those brackets. We first start with the variance. So that is expected value of the squared bracket and then we can plug in the definition of the, this very same expression as we have just derived. We then open the brackets. Okay, so this is nothing else as the autocorrelation of order one. And now what we need to do, we need to deal with those terms. We first consider the expectation of the d mean epsilon squared and the error term at time period t. For that, we open the brackets and plug in the definition of the error term. We know that expected value of this error term is zero. Thus, what we're left with is only the first expectation, where we could plug in the definition of epsilon t. All right, so that would be then the expected value of sigma t to the power of 4, and in the bracket you have zt to the power of 4 minus zt to the power of 2. We now can add and subtract some terms in the zt bracket. And we do it because it allows us to rewrite the whole thing as zt to the power of 2 minus 1. We also do not forget the redundant terms which we have added. The first bracket could be then written as sigma t z t minus 1 squared. And in the other bracket, of course, you could separate the expectations of the sigmas and z's. Oh, this is a mistake here. There is sigma t squared there. The first bracket is nothing else as the epsilon t squared minus sigma t squared squared. That is the variance of the error term. And remember, we have shown that this is a finite guy, and we will just denote it as sigma squared nu. Lastly, we need to take care of the expectation of the demand sigma squared t 
and beta than the error term at the previous period. In order to obtain this expression, we need to plug in the definition in terms of t minus 1. Our previous derivations help us to simplify the whole thing. So we have our beta phi or phi, the autoregressive coefficient, and this is the quantity which we have just derived. This is nothing else as the sigma squared nu. Now this is shown to be zero in the previous exercise when we were showing the Martingale different sequence properties. Finally, you have the sigma squared nu by definition in the last term. So if we combine all the terms together, what is our gamma zero? Gamma zero is an autoregressive coefficient times gamma one plus sigma squared nu, which is one minus beta phi plus beta two, power of two. Okay, that helps. And now we can finally consider what is gamma 1. So what's the expected value of the autocorrelation of order 1? We, of course, plug in the definition of the autoregressive representation of epsilon t. And then we immediately see that the first term is just the variance term. Okay, what about that? The correlation between the error term at time period t and the epsilon t minus 1 minus mu. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, I don't know. And we have derived uh, an expression for the last term just before. So that would be beta sigma squared mu. The shock at period T has uh, really nothing to do with the previous history. Therefore, we can write down the first autocorrelation like this. And finally, we can plug in the definition of gamma zero, which we have to write before. We now need to collect all the terms with the gamma zero. and all the terms with the sigma squared nu. You immediately see a pattern there, and thus our gamma zero, the order correlation of order zero, if you like, or just the variance, can be written as one minus phi beta, phi minus beta, divided by one minus phi squared. And using then all the time series properties, we could show that all the consecutive uh, gammas will be just autoregressive lag times the previous one. And finally, we can arrive to our autocorrelations. An autocorrelation of order one is defined as the ratio of the gamma. So, what we do? Finally, it's time to plug in the definition of our autoregressive guy. And we arrive to the expression that it is alpha plus alpha power of 2. And for all the consecutive autocorrelations, that would be just phi times the previous autocorrelation. Okay, so what did we learn? Well, we have learned that the persistence of the decay and autocorrelation function is now governed by this expression. And whether alpha and beta, if they're close to one, then the persistence will be higher. Okay, 
So now you know how to derive the autocorrelation decay. What we now need to look for is the leverage effect. The leverage effect um, formally can be represented by the covariance of the difference in the returns of the two consecutive periods and how the previous shock kind of affects the future volatility change. Okay, so how do we do that? We first need to understand that in our specification of the return process, the first bracket is just difference in epsilon shocks. And we can write down the difference in the conditional variances by plugging in the definition of um, GART11. We do it such that omegas disappear and then we just have the difference in the squared epsilons and the beta times the difference in the squared sigmas. Okay, now time to remember what is the covariance between two random variables. It's the expected value of the product minus the product of expectations. And oh, this is wrong. Now we will consider first of all the, pro, the expected values conditional on ft minus 1. So what do you expect of a shock at time t at the period t minus 1? You do not expect it to happen. So the first expectation is just epsilon t minus 1. It's deterministic on ft minus 1. Uh, now we need to consider the conditional expectation of the second term, which is alpha times difference in the epsilons and the beta difference in the sigmas. Okay, now we can pull out the expression for the whole covariance. Conditional on ft minus 1, this is important. So we first need the product of the epsilon t minus 1 with the first term. Right, now it's time to open the brackets for everything which is not deterministic on ft minus 1. What do we know about the second term? Well, we know that the sigmas, they are deterministic on ft minus 1 because of the GART11 specification. Thus, we could write it down as just beta and then the difference in the sigmas without any expectations whatsoever. And then we only have minus epsilon t minus 1 on ft minus 1 expectation left. Then, of course, we use the same property on epsilon t minus 1 being deterministic on ft minus 1. Finally, the sigmas also could be going without any expectation. Okay, time to rearrange the terms. Let's consider the first expectation. The first expectation is alpha times conditional expectation of kind of skewness of the shock on ft minus 1. Then we have a deterministic epsilon t minus 1 and the expected value of epsilon t squared. Remember, about the higher moments, we actually have something to say. Finally, alpha epsilon t minus 1 squared and the epsilon t, this guy is 0, OK. Then alpha, the deterministic shock, which we kind of observe. And then if you look closely, the terms with the sigmas, they cancel out a little bit. And the rest remains. So we have an ft minus 1 expectation of the second moment of the shock 
then the term which cancels out here. Now those two terms they also cancel out. This is zero in expectation, so what we are left with is on the alpha times the expected value of epsilon t to the power of 3 conditional on ft minus 1. We can now insert the definition of epsilon t in terms of the zt, which has unconditional expectation and filtration, and then the sigma t squared. All right. So the t minus 1 and t minus 1 on the pass filtration, they're actually fixed. Given the information available at t minus 1, we do observe those quantities. And what do you have here is the killer of the whole leverage effect is this guy. This guy is assumed to be zero in the standard normal, normally distributed random variable, so there is no leverage effect for the garch one, one process. Last property which we need to consider, I believe it's property 8 or 9, whatever, I lost count, is the actual difference between conditional and unconditional uh, variance of the return process. We now consider the case of an AR1 GARCH11 process. So we have GARCH11 in the conditional second moment, and we have a conditional mean specified by an autoregressive process of order 1. And now we need to fill the difference between the conditional and unconditional variances of the return process. We plug in the definition of yt. The yt and the constant given past filtration, they're constants, all right? So what you end up is, is only the conditional variance of the error term. Now, we have seen lots of derivations for that. So this is the usual zt sigma t ft minus 1 story. Then you know that sigma t is deterministic and the zt has unit variance. So basically, you have the GARCH11 specification there. All right, now we are going to use this fact to arrive at the unconditional variance of our AR1 GARCH11 process by applying the law of total variance. We need the conditional, the variance of conditional expectation and the expected value of the conditional variance. Okay, the expected value of the conditional variance, that would be the expected value of our GARCH11. This guy, you know. And then we have the variance of the conditional mean. All right, so what do we have? We have the usual ZT squared sigma t squared interpretation and then beta sigma squared t minus 1 in expectation as well and then under stationarity we have here the same variance which stands on the left hand side of the equation thus we could write down under stationarity condition of course the variance of yt as follows Okay, the unconditional expectation of sigma squared t or t minus 1, we also know, it is omega divided by 1 minus alpha minus beta. Then you do your usual business and you do your linear algebra. And then finally, you arrive at the final expression. which is constant unconditional variance of the AR1 GARCH11 return process.